so many facts and figures and things to think about when looking for a new bike. So let's take a look at all those facts and figures and wade through the equation so that you end up getting the right bike for you. So you've just passed your test, you're looking for your first big bike, you would think it's pretty easy, you've got an idea in your head what you want or you've always coveted a certain make and model and you think it's really simple, I'll just go out, I'll spend all my hard in cash on it and bang, boom, job done. Well, unfortunately, um, most of the time it doesn't work out like that. Um, you will often find that when you get the bike and you start to having to live with it for any extended period of time, you will soon find out all the weaknesses of the bike and perhaps why the bike wasn't right for you in the first place. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, at the end of the day, this isn't me telling you what bike you should buy. Um, there are lots and lots of different buyers out there who want different things from the bike. So different bikes are going to suit different people and different people are going to have to think about different things when they buy the bike, buy the bike to meet their uh, needs. So for example, the type of buyer I have been over the years has changed. I mean, when I was younger, what was really important to me was the looks of the bike or how fast the bike will go. Whereas now I'm a lot older and I do different things with my bike. I go out touring. I don't have a car, so I need my bike to be able to do everything. So the things that I will take into consideration when buying a bike now are totally different than what I would have taken into consideration when I was younger. So for example, when I was younger, I was into scooters. That's what I started off on. And uh, I always wanted a, a tuned Lambretta, race tuned Lambretta. Uh, I bought myself a GP200 with a TS1 uh, sport kit on, big exhaust, had all the modifications on. Uh, it had the little thin racing seat. And to be honest, it was the worst two wheeled vehicle I have ever bought in my life. Um, it, was it was uncomfortable, um, it vibrated, uh, you couldn't stop it, it was an absolute death trap but I don't regret buying it because at the end of the day I used to park that scooter in front of the house so that when I sat on the settee I could see through the window and look at it and it always put a massive smile on my face and it always put a massive smile on my face every time I opened it up and thrashed it down the street and there's nothing wrong with that if that's what you want from your bike then that's what you go for you know that is the most important thing to keep in mind when looking at this review and everything I'm saying what's right for you is the most important thing but I'm just going to go through a few of the different things to take into consideration when buying a bike. Okay, so if you are one of the people I've just been talking about, it's very easy for you to go out and get the best bike for you because you're just buying it with your heart and your head doesn't matter. So how the bike rides, what the bike looks like, if you've got your mind set on a bike and you buy that bike and you're happy with it, then it it's a simple equation for you. You just go with your first instincts. However, if you're like me and um, you need a bike for a specific purpose or you need a one trick pony that does everything, then there is a lot to take into consideration. Um, other types of buyers out there, you know, the biking population is getting older and older, uh, the average age wise. And, you know, with that comes you know, injuries, comes disability, sickness, um, health issues that can make riding a bike difficult. So that is another very important thing that we'll be looking at. Um, so let's get into it. Okay, at the end of this video, I'm going to reveal what the best bike is you can buy for everybody. One bike for every man and his dog. And I can give you the heads up, it's not this bike here. So stay tuned to the end of the video and I will show you which is the best bike that you can buy. 
So what I'm going to do now, I am going to take all the things into consideration for somebody who needs a bike that is able to do everything. So doing the commute in town, going for a, a nice ride on a Sunday afternoon, putting a smile on your face on the twisties, perhaps going uh, touring for a week or a long weekend. So all those things I'm going to be looking at now. Okay, so um, the first thing we should touch on is um, what can we actually do? How do we go about looking at all these things and gathering all this information? So um, there are a number of things we can do and some are good ways and some are not so good ways. So let's have a look at that in detail. Okay, so in the beginning, before there was uh, the interweb, um, things were a lot more difficult. You know, we would have to rely on either just going to a dealer or talking to our mates or, um, you know, getting in the yellow pages and uh, looking for bookshops. Remember them? Bookshops where we could go and buy books that review bikes and the history of certain bikes and things like that. Oh, hello. Um, I was wondering, do you have a copy of How to Buy a Motorcycle for a Bald-Headed, Fat, Middle-Aged Gentleman? It's by J.R. Hartley. I'm afraid it's a very old copy. Oh, you do? That's wonderful. May I reserve it? Oh, yes, of course, my name. It's J.R. Hartley. And I must actually uh, apologise to any viewers who are young or from uh, a country outside the UK. That was just uh, a little bit of a Mickey take on an old advert for Yellow Pages <laughs> that used to be on the uh, UK TV. OK, so um, one of the things that we can do today to prevent us from ending up on that long to disappointment and regret is we can go online and we can look at the spec sheets. So um, you may think that that is a good thing to do. Is that really the best way? Is it? Is it really though? However, um, spec sheets and facts and figures and black and white aren't all they seem to be. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, let's break it down. Um, quite often, facts and figures of a bike which makes it look favourable to your needs don't actually correlate with how the bike actually feels when you sit on the bike or when you ride the bike. So what do I mean about that? Well, let's get into it a little bit. OK, so let's take uh, the weight of the bike. So, for example, if um, you've got a, a back problem or a knee problem, you struggle with moving heavy bikes and you're trying to choose between two bikes and one is, say, six or seven kilograms lighter than the other, uh, you may think, well, yeah, boom, I'll go for the lightest bike because the spec sheet says it's a lot lighter. Now, in reality, this might not actually be the case with the bike because what's important with a bike is how the bike carries its weight. So if you have a bike like this one, the Benelli TRK502X, uh, it's a particularly heavy bike, but it also carries its weight quite high up. It's a top heavy bike. The tank's high up. Um, when that's full of petrol, um, it makes the bike very difficult to push around off the stand because it feels as though you're battling against the weight. However, um, a GS1250 BMW um, with that boxer engine, it carries its weight very, very low. So although it's still a heavy bike, um, it's a little bit, it feels easier to move around. And um, I've never owned a GS. Uh, however, if you go on uh, some of the pages on Facebook where people who've owned GSs for long term periods and they review the GS850 against the GS1250. On paper, the 850 is actually lighter than the GS1250. But all those owners, all those experienced owners who've had the bikes for a long, long time will all tell you that um, 
the GS 1250 feels easier to move around off the stand and at very low speeds because it carries the weight lower down. So even though it's heavier than the 850, the 850, the lighter bike, in real terms, feels heavier. So that is one way that spec sheets can lie. Another way that spec sheets can um, not really correlate to the, the truth of things is seat height. So um, if you're short in stature or if you've got uh, lower limb problems and you want something that you can easily plant your feet down flat on the floor, um, you may have two bikes and on the spec sheets one has a seat height that is three or four inches lower than uh, another bike and so you think yeah I'll go with that because I'll be able to get my feet down on the floor however again that might not be the case because what you have to take into consideration is the width of the seat so bikes give the height vertically from the top of the seat vertically down to the floor now if you have a wide seat this means that your legs are going to come out at an angle which will increase the distance down to the floor Sounds a bit complicated? Well, let me explain. Okay, so how does the angle your uh, legs go down to the floor alter the distance in between the top of the seat and the floor? So here you can see at the side, uh, I have a plant pot, which is, I don't know, about six inches, something like that, uh, tall from the floor. And you can see that my foot is now flat on the floor. However, keeping my legs straight, if I bring my leg out to an angle, you can see there are no bends in my legs and yet my foot is now on top. So that has raised the distance to the floor by a good six inches by having my leg going out at an angle. So I hope that makes sense for you. So uh, I keep mentioning touring and um, you know, it's quite easy to make the mistake of, you know, because that's the one thing that I enjoy most about my bike. It's so easy to get sidetracked and get tunnel vision into buying a bike just for touring. But if you remember at the beginning of the video, I said I need my bike to be able to do everything. Um, so I could quite easily get sidetracked, go out and buy a Honda Goldwing and then find out that when I want to go down as they're on it or when I want to go into town or go into Edinburgh getting through the traffic it's an absolute nightmare or again perhaps I, I can't get in the garage because I haven't got enough room so it's very very easy to get sidetracked and this is why I'm doing this video to try and stop you falling into that so always remember you know the most important thing is to keep at the forefront of your mind what you need from this bike um, so in my case I need a bike that does absolutely everything I need it to be comfortable I need it to be fun in the twisties I need it to be able to carry luggage I need it to commute I need it to be able to do long distances good fuel range so for me it became quite obvious that I needed to go down the route of the adventure bike because the adventure bikes you have a good range um, of tank sizes of engine sizes of heights and all of them you can put luggage on um, you, there's good aftermarket parts for all the the uh, adventure bikes because they're such a popular brand um, I do like the super naked um, I like the looks of them I like the way they ride but they don't fit the criteria and it would be easy to go out and do a test ride on a super naked and think oh my god this is amazing buy it and then 12 months down the road i'm absolutely sick of it i can't go touring on it can't do this and it can't do that on it all the parts are dead expensive for it so you see what i'm trying to get at here okay so there you can see how spec sheets can not perhaps be the best thing to you know take 100 percent on face value there are certain things that a spec sheet won't tell you about a bike or even though the facts and figures may be true they may mislead you and send you down that to disappointment and regret okay so um what other things are that we can do to try and find out what the right bike for us is well um another thing is what you're doing now 
uh, watching YouTube and watching reviews. However, one thing to take in mind with YouTube reviews is that it is a subjective um, view of what the bike is on how that reviewer actually feels about the bike. Um, what I will say is that the best thing to do if you're going to try and go with um, the YouTube reviewer uh, way of things is watch lots and lots of reviews from different reviewers about the same bike because you will find that uh, a pattern will emerge. So if all the reviewers say that the seat is uncomfortable and it's too hard, then you can pretty much say that that is going to be the case with the seat. The problems you get is sometimes you'll review, and especially with things like brakes, one reviewer will say, oh, the brakes aren't very good, there's no feedback, they're very wooden. Whereas another reviewer may say, well, the brakes are okay, they're nothing special, but they do inspire confidence and they do stop. And that's, that can be a problem. So the way that we get past that is, like I say, watching lots and lots of reviews by different reviewers about the same bike and then sort of trying to build up a picture about what they say. Um, another thing is if you watch a lot of YouTube like me, you tend to um, see who the good reviewers are and who aren't. Um, you know, you'll get a lot of reviewers who... Um, are very single-minded so they might be reviewers who love sports bikes and they compare everything to a sports bike so they'll get on um, an adventure bike and they just completely slag it off because it won't do what a sports bike will do. Um, on this channel I never try to do that, um, I try and keep an open mind, I look at what the bike is designed to do, I look at what who the bike is designed for um, and then I try and review it in that vein. Obviously, I will put my own input into it, all reviewers do, but I try to do it in a more balanced way. You know, I wouldn't get on a 125cc motorbike and then complain it's too slow um, because it's a 125. It's not aimed at me with a full license who's been riding big bike for years. So um, that is something else to keep in mind when watching YouTube reviews. Okay, so what is the best way to find out which bike is uh, right for you? Well, um, it's not rocket science. Hello, Mr. Money Spider. Um, it's not rocket science. The best way is to go out and test ride it. Um, unfortunately, a majority of people don't have the times and means to go out and test ride every motorbike in a showroom. Um, it would be absolutely lovely to be able to do that, but unfortunately, um, it's not really a reality that can be uh, met. So what we do is we look at bikes um, in a logical way and compare what that bike can do to what our needs are. So how do we do that? How do we get to our short list of bikes that we want to actually uh, go out and test ride? So let's go through it now. So we've already covered uh, the first aspect of this. First of all, decide what type of ride you are, what type of person you are. Um, as I said, if you are somebody who is just after something that, you know, is just pleasing to the eye or just to, you know, scratch that itch, the bucket list, something you've always wanted, it's easy. There's not much to take into consideration for you. Um, However, if you're one of the aforementioned people, you know, an older rider with, you know, health conditions, if you want it for commuting, if you want it for go touring on, if you specifically want it for getting through city traffic to commute on every day, um, those are the things that you should be looking at. And then with a critical eye, looking at the bikes that are out there in your price range, and you know saying will that cover those needs so that is how you sort of zone in on the type of bike you want so let's go back to uh, my needs my needs or I need a bike to do everything and uh, I'm not just doing that because it's me 
um, I'm doing that because if you need a bike that covers everything, it means we can look at every aspect in detail for this video, which will help everybody out across the board, regardless of what type of rider you are. Okay, so um, this information, these categories are not rocket science and everybody's going to go, oh, well, that's obvious. But you would be surprised how many people don't take these things into consideration. So, first of all, um, comfort. If you are in need of a comfy bike or if you are in need of a bike that is low, um, it's not rocket science. Don't go out and choose a sports bike. Um, don't go out and... Uh, by a really tall adventure bike uh, your feet are not going at the floor a sports bike's really uncomfortable so you see where this is going okay category two so what you are actually going to use this bike for um, so here comes the caveat with what i've just said about comfort um, if you are a rider who only rides on sunny days on a sunday um, so you hardly ride the bike throughout the year, it's just a Sunday afternoon dream machine, um, then perhaps, you know, it may not be that important to have the comfort if you're only going to spend one or two hours on the bike once a week for a few weeks of the year. Um, and if that's the case, then you perhaps want to be looking at a super naked, you perhaps want to be looking at a sports bike. So you have to balance out uh, your needs and use. Category three. Okay, so we have to be thinking about um, where we keep the bike. Um, many, many years ago, um, I moved into a, a short-term house. Uh, I was just in between jobs and in between houses, uh, and I moved into a terraced house in Leeds. Um, and I had a pan-European, Honda pan-European at the time. And I never even give it a thought when I went ahead, I viewed the house and I put a deposit down, it was, it was a rental house, and then when I come to put my bike in the backyard, um, it wouldn't fit through the gate. Uh, it would have meant I would have had to knock a wall down to get the bike in, which was a big problem because it was a high crime area, and as a result, uh, my bike, it wasn't stolen, but there were numerous attempts where the bike, people attempted to rob the bike, they smashed the steering lock, they smashed the ignition um, on numerous occasions. So think about where you are going to store the bike. Okay, next category, uh, which is a good segue over to insurance. So you've got to think about the financial side of things. You may be able to afford to buy the bike, but can you afford to keep the bike? So um, where you live, if you live in a high crime area, is it going to be kept on the street? What are the insurance quotes that you're going to have to pay for um, keeping the bike? Secondly, um, if you're not very mechanically minded, you know, um, does the bike cost a lot to get parts for? Are there parts readily available? Um, if it's a Chinese uh, bike, are there garages local to you that will actually work on it if it does need fixing? Uh, the last thing you want to do is go out and buy a bike if you live in a very rural area like me and it's miles and miles to your nearest garage only to find out that that garage won't work on Chinese bikes and then you end up having to do like 100 miles to get the bike fixed to find a garage that will work on them. So um, look at the financial side of keeping the bike. Um, another thing to consider on the financial side is resale value. So if you are the kind of person who likes to change their bikes um, at the drop of a hat and gets bored of a bike very quickly, or you know, just for maintenance purposes or whatever, you don't like to hold on to a bike too long. Um, you know, you don't want to be buying a bike that you know absolutely drops thousands and thousands of pounds the minute you ride it out to the showroom. So yeah, resale values could be an important one for you to look at. Okay, so uh, another thing to take into consideration is the fuel range of the bike. Um, now, if you are planning on using the bike as I do to go on long tours, 
you want a fairly big capacity tank. There's nothing worse than having a really short range tank and having to fill up every 10 minutes. Now, um, I know a lot of people out there who live uh, down south and live in very um, urban areas will say, well, you know, it's not that much of a problem just to call in a petrol station. However, you come to the north of Scotland and <laughs> you're riding around the highlands, you might go 200 miles without seeing a, a fuel station that's open. So take into consideration what you're going to be using the bike for, where you're going to be riding the bike. Another thing to look at, uh, again, is look at um, what kind of drive the bike has, whether it's got chain drive or whether it has um, shaft drive. So again, if you um, are a person who absolutely hates doing any sort of maintenance on your bike, then perhaps uh, a shaft drive would be the way to go. Um, I can't tell you how much I hate having to regularly clean and oil my chain. Uh, it is the bane of my life. Um, as I said, I've had a Honda Pan European in the past. I've still got it. It's mothballed in my garage. And uh, all I have to do with that bike is wash it. <laughs> That's it, really. Um, and having chain drives, especially in winter, oh, they're just a pain in the neck. Um, especially if you're like me, riddled with arthritis and uh, you've got pain kneeling down and getting access to the chain. So that's another thing to take into consideration. Another thing to look at uh, when you're purchasing your bike is um, what type of skill set you have, what type of confidence you have as a rider. Um, this is a bit subjective. Um, I know that a lot of people will say, well, a motorbike will only go as fast as you make it to go. And um, once you get on the bike, you'll soon get used to it and learn how to ride it. Um, I agree with that to some extent, but at the same time, I also know riders that just aren't confident and it doesn't matter how long they ride or how much they ride a bike they never really gain that confidence. And if they go out and they buy like um, a Fireblade or, you know, any super sports bike or a big adventure bike like the, the KTMs, the Super Dukes that are absolutely mental, um, you could end up finding yourself in a world of pain with that bike. Um, you may end up, you know, being frightened to ride it and, going out on it, it becomes a chore and you're just not enjoying the experience that you should be enjoying. You know, when you have a motorbike, you should be etching to get out every second of the day to get out and have the enjoyment of riding that bike. And um, I do know riders in the past who've bought bikes that have been too much for them and uh, they've just ended up selling them because of that, because they're just not enjoying them. You know, in the head, yeah. Um, we all want to be Rossi or Marquez or whatever, but uh, actually getting out on the road and trying to do that kind of stuff, oh, it's a different kettle of fish. So once we've got to the stage where we've taken all these considerations um, to heart, and um, the next step is, all you've got to do is just narrow it down to the bike that fulfills all that criteria. Um, once you've narrowed it down to that specific type of bike or bikes, you can then draw up a short list of the ones that you really like the looks of, and then you can go out and you can do the test ride. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of going out and test riding a bike because it doesn't matter how much research you do, if you do not ride that bike, um, you could be in for a world of pro problems. If you just go and order it off the internet or from a dealer about test riding, it could end up being the worst mistake you ever made. Um, recently, I test rode the Honda Transalp uh, 750. Um, it's one of those bikes that's been on my radar, been waiting and waiting for it to come out, the idea of it and the specs of it. Everything told me that that bike would be the perfect bike for me, that it would be a big step up from my Benelli. Um, I test rode one at the ABR Festival, and although it is an absolutely brilliant bike, 
um, for how much it costs. Is it a big step up from the Benelli? No, not at all. Um, between the two, when you look for value for money, uh, you look at comfort, I think the Benelli knocks spots off the Honda. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that this is a better bike, I'm saying this is a better bike for the money you pay. The difference between the two bikes is it's only like that, whereas the price is like that. So um, I didn't go out and purchase the Honda. And to be honest, I was really disappointed and I was gutted um, because, you know, I've had this bike now for nearly five years. I love the bones of it. However, um, I'm suffering with arthritis at the moment and it is getting difficult for me to ride. So I am looking for another alternative at the moment. Yeah, so test riding a bike is the way to go. As I've said, um, don't get carried away by performance or just one category, the comfort or how fast it goes or whatever. Um, try and think about a route where you will experience all the different types of riding you are going to do. So, um, you know, perhaps take a little bit of city riding, a little bit of country riding, uh, fast twisties, take it on uh, the motorway or the dual carriageway, see what it's like at cruising speed. Um, all these things you have to take into consideration. So try and do a varied route when you go out and you do your test ride. Um, and hopefully that way you will eventually find the bike that is right for you. Okay, so time to reveal the best bike that you can buy, no matter who you are and what use you have. So, without further ado, the best bike is... Yeah, there you have it. It doesn't exist. We're all different. We all want different things from our bikes. What suits you doesn't suit me. So take into account everything I've said on this video and hopefully you'll end up with the right bike for you. Okay, I'm gonna wrap the video up here. Um, just to let you know, I've already mentioned about the average age of the bike population increasing. Um, and with that, we're all getting injuries. We're all not as mobile as we used to be. So I'm gonna be doing an in-depth video looking at riding with injury and disability. Uh, and I'm gonna be looking at all the things that we can do to try and make our riding more enjoyable and prolong the amount of time that we can actually spend on the bike. So it's a bit of a niche subject, but if that's something that you'd be interested in taking a look at, keep an eye out on the channel, that will be coming up soon. Um, so lastly, I'd just like to say, if you've enjoyed the video, please press the like button. It takes two seconds of your time and it really, really helps the channel uh, and helps me to get um, the channel moving forward with more subscribers and on to subscribing yeah definitely if you think that I'm doing a good job please pay me the honour of uh, pressing the subscribe button you don't get bombarded with emails it just means every time you switch your YouTube channel on um, you're more likely to get my videos recommended to you by YouTube okay with that said thank you for watching everybody ride safe Bike Rider Reviews out.